if you would open up to Second Peter chapter 3, we're going to go over a few verses there. Last time I think I filled in for Jeff, I think I bit off way more than I could chew. <laughs> so this morning I'm not going to do that. I, I have two verses here. Uh, we're going to look at verse 8 and verse 9. And really it's the, it's the ending of this letter. And really this comes at the end of Peter's life as he wrote this letter to the people that were scattered throughout um, really uh, Asia Minor there in modern day Turkey. He wrote to them and he's writing this second letter to them. He calls them beloved. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's really a blessing. This is at the end of his life, probably AD 64 or so. We don't know exactly the dates, you know, that this was written or when he was actually martyred, but he was martyred in Rome. And, um, and this was one of the last you know, chapters, or this is one of the last that we have recorded anyway, that he had written to the church. And so this is really a blessing. And I think that it fits really well. I think it fits in really well with where we're at because we're talking, we're in, I mean, Jeff's teaching through Revelation, right? So uh, this, this, this letter deals largely with the idea of the second coming of Christ and just when he comes. And there's reassurance in here about that fact for us as his children. And so as we're going through, I mean, we're excited. I don't know if you have been excited about going through Revelation. I mean, we're looking forward to his return and, um, and we're excited here. Uh, we want the, we, we look for that. That's our hope, right? Maybe you've gotten, maybe it's caused you being in Revelation. You've gotten on, you know, the internet, you're looking out there at all the different podcasts and things like that. There's all kinds of stuff out there. There's all kinds of things that people are saying, but the bottom line is this is our hope, right? That Jesus is going to return, that he's coming back for his people, that this life isn't all. And so, um, you know, in the beginning of this, bo- this, uh, this uh, chapter here, uh, Peter says there in verse 2, he says, but I, uh, or actually in verse 1, he says, I, I, I want to stir up your per- pure minds by way of um, reminding or a reminder. And so that's my intent this morning. I just really feel like we need to be stirred up in, rem- in remembering who God is and part of his nature and his character, because it's really easy for us to see and we can think, oh yeah, things are getting ready. God is getting ready to come, you know, and, and all of that. But, you know, where is that? And we don't see that. And um, so that's, that's really the heart and the attitude that Peter is uh, dealing with here. He's not wanting the people in church, the, the brothers and sisters in the Lord to become discouraged by the fact that maybe the Lord hasn't come back, that they're still in the circumstances. Circumstance. At that time, you know, that was when Nero was reigning as emperor. There was a lot of persecution at the church, in the church at that time. And so, you know, they saw a lot of unrest where they lived. They saw a lot of uh, persecution towards their faith and towards the Christian faith. And so it, uh, when we experience that, I mean, we're people too, you know, we can identify with that. It becomes discouraging and it's really easy to get inwardly focused. And so Peter's desire here really is to pull them out and to stir them up and to remind them of God's character. And this one thing is what I entitled this message. And uh, let's read through these two verses here and then we'll, uh, we'll just come back and we'll talk about the certain things that are listed here in these verses. Um, and it says in verse 8, chapter 3, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I entitled this, this one thing, and I, and I, and, and, this is the thing that Peter, in, in this controversy or this discouragement, in this place where the church is at, he wants to remind them of this one thing. So what is the one thing? There's all kinds of, there's, there's several things that are listed in those two verses. But, you know, if you look at that, I mean, it's a sentence and it ends there with a period, although the periods aren't necessarily in the original language. But it says there, beloved, do not forget this one thing. And it says that, the, that with the Lord, or with the, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years. 
and a thousand years as one day. This is the one thing. God is, in, an, in other words, you know, God is timeless. The one thing that we need to remember, and I think that this is really great for us because <laughs> we're bound by time, right? I mean, we totally are bound in time. This is something that is easy for us to forget in the circumstances and in the places that we find ourselves. It's really easy to forget that God is outside of it. I mean, have you ever been praying through a circumstance or a situation and you become discouraged because you don't see any results? You don't see anything happening? You're wondering what is going on? What has God abandoned me? You know, in the context here, you know, Peter is talking about, he's talking about, you know, the second coming of Christ. And um, earlier up there, if you, if you look there, he's talking about people that come and they, um, you know, they're scoffing at the promise of God. In verse 3, it says there, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? This is the attitude that, you know, that Peter is confronting here with this idea that God has promised his second coming, and yet we're not realizing that, and there's discouragement that may set in. But this is a principle that not only applies to that, it applies to all areas of our life. It really applies to each and every circumstance that we might find ourselves in where discouragement might set in. And so the application here can definitely specifically be towards the second coming of Christ. I mean, we're all hoping and looking for that day. That is our hope. But we also have certain situations in our life that we're experiencing right now where we're desiring the Lord to show up in that experience, in that circumstance, in whatever is going on. We want to see him working in that. And so God gives us this, or Peter gives us this reminder that God is timeless. He's completely outside of time. You know, uh, when I was putting this together, I was thinking, I was going to ask you the, this question. If you guys had all the time in the world, what would you do? I mean, if you had all the time in the world, what would you do? I, I, I thought that was, when, I, when, I, when that came up in my heart, I was like, well, I don't know. That's a hard question to really answer. What would you do? I mean, time is a funny thing, isn't it? It's, it's hard to think of timelessness because we're completely and totally bound by it. I mean, we're so bound by it that all that we have to control is what? <laughs> right here, right? Right now. The thing that I say, the thing that I do right here in this space. That's all the control that I really have in time. Because, you know, in the past, I can't really do anything about that. In the future, I can look at it and I can, I can suppose, you know, and God says that, you know, that the uh, you know, that we lay our plans, the, the plans of man, we, we think those things out, but the steps are ordered by the Lord, you know? <laughs> so we can, we can try to plan. I, you know, at work, I have a lot of things come across my desk that are talking about and, you know, giving me ideas about time management, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, every week, those things are popping in my inbox, you know, seminars, people that are speaking on this or tools that I can use. If I'll just pay this amount of money, I can manage all my time. And that sounds really great because what? Because I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time with management. I want to control all that, right? Uh, you know, we get in this place where we realize we want, a lot, we want to do a lot of things. We have a lot of things on our minds. We have a lot of things that we think should happen. And yet there's a limited amount of days, right? Limited amount of hours, limited amount of minutes. And here we are constrained by that. I think what Peter really wants us to see, we're constrained by it, but God is not in any way. He is not constrained by time. In any circumstance, in the coming of the Lord, his promise is true. Just because he's promised that and we haven't seen the fruition of it doesn't mean that he hasn't been faithful or that he won't be faithful. So that timelessness is super important for us to understand. It's hard for us to grab sometimes. This is what physicists define time. Found this in ThoughtCo, the magazine or online magazine. And it says, physicists de define time in this simple way uh, as a progression of events from the past to the present into the future. Basically, if a system is unchanging, it is timeless. Time can be considered to be 
um, the fourth dimension of reality, used to describe events in three-dimensional space. It is not something that we can see, touch, or taste, but we can measure its passage, and we're and and I would add, we're affected by it in in a lot of ways. Our life is affected by it. So uh, I I underline that basically, if a system is unchanging, it is timeless. See that that the physicists won't say that um, if someone <laughs> or if a being is unchanging, they are timeless. But we know, as God's children, and from the Word of God, we're going to look at a couple verses here that really talk about that. That God fits that definition perfectly. He is unchanging. It puts him in that place of timelessness. Another thing that I was thinking of when I was on my uh, and I have done this before. I don't know if you've been in this place. But when the Lord does return, have you ever thought about what that's going to be like? Have you ever thought and, and like been on your bed at night thinking, well, I, and, and the thought is, well, I don't know what that's going to be like. Am I really excited about that? I mean, what is eternity, right? Have you ever sat there wondering, what are we going to do? What are we going to do for the rest of our life, uh, for the rest of eternity? I mean, it's hard to really even think that way, right? I mean, I've been on that place spinning in my, and then you hear the, you hear somebody say, oh, well, we're just going to worship the Lord, right? So then you're thinking, then you're thinking, or I'm thinking, yeah, we're going to be singing for the rest of our life, right? I mean, we put that into our little BB brains and we think, well, that's worship or however we've defined worship, you know? I'm going to be praying for the rest of my life. You know, we have these little constructs that we have that, that we are kind of constricted to. So it's really hard for us to think outside of that and know what is that actually going to look like when the fact of the matter is what? In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, that we can prove what is our reasonable service. That, that, that word there, service, is worship. You know, so it becomes our whole life. That whole existence is going to be worship, but it's all of it. Yeah, we may be singing. We may be proclaiming the, the uh, you know, the grace of God, the mercy of God, all the beautiful things that he's done in our lives. We are trophies of what he's done. I mean, that's all worship to the Lord, right? I mean, that is all worship to the Lord. You know, I'm sure there's going to be things that God has for us to do, um, you know, it's all worship. But the fact of the matter is, well, we're going to be outside of time. We're not going to be constrained to anything. So it's so hard for us to even put ourselves in that place of really, what is that timelessness? And so when we think of what Peter is saying here, that to remember this one thing, it's really good for us to remember that. It's good for us to think about that. It's good for us to know that God is outside of that because it br brings great hope um, in the situations that we find ourselves. Here's a great verse here in Exodus 3 where um, Moses was being called to God's purposes and to his work. And this is how God defines himself. He says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The idea there is I am. He is the one that's existent in the past, present, future. He is in all. He is just there. He, that is, he, he, there is no time there. He exists. And Here's another really good one. We looked at this, and uh, when we went through the first chapter in Revelation, you know, Jeff taught through this, but this is a great reminder for us. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. See, these are the ways, these two verses are, are, are God himself defining who he is. I'm outside of time. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. <laughs> you know, I'm in, I, w I was, I am, <laughs> I will be. He is in all of that. And so that can be a huge comfort for us. Here's another one. In Malachi 3, 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Um, that idea of I am. He exists. He is the existent one. Basically, he doesn't change. 
He is timeless. And so as we remember that, we realize that he is. That's the one thing that Peter wants us to remember. So with the second company, with the circumstances, with the situations that we're in, you know, when we're trying to control and when we think that they're, uh, that that we've got this planned out and it should go a certain way. Okay, here's a great example from just yesterday, right? <laughs> um, so um, oftentimes when I, um, you know, when I have an opportunity to teach, um, I have another job as well. So um, I, I like the mornings. That's when I really study well. That's when I really feel like the Lord is working in my heart, in my mind. I kind of slow down. As the day goes along, I'm finding that more and more. Um, so that morning, so I was really looking forward to yesterday morning. So I was really looking forward to sitting down and just getting a grip on all of what the Lord was putting on my heart. So um, in the early, early hours of the morning, I hear from out in the other room, I hear this, Aaron, Aaron. Aaron, come here, Aaron. And so here I am, I'm laying in bed, kind of in that place where you're just kind of wandering in your mind, you know, and I was thinking about the message, thinking about what I was going to do, when I was going to get up, all those kinds of things, studying um, and all of that. And, and Brenda's just in major pain, just in really bad pain. She was saying it was like the peak of the pain was like a 10. And um, she, and so afterwards I'm, I'm talking to her and I'm saying, well, how is it like childbirth? And she's like, yeah, it's right there in that childbirth pain. So she's feeling all this. And so we're calling the doctor, trying to, you know, figure out what we should do. Should we go to the emergency room? Just having this ab abdominal pain. And so, uh, <laughs> they ended up saying, well, to be safe, you really should go to the emergency room. So, we went to the emergency room early. We ended up spending nine hours in the emergency room trying to figure this stuff out. She had to get a CT scan and and all. And I mean, it was like, so here I am. I, I've, I've made these plans. I've stopped, you know, I hadn't, I, I had put some things together, but I was really looking forward to that. And then this was my plan that I was going to, that I was going to do. And here it is interrupted by nine hours of being in the emergency room. So anyway, the good news is it was just, uh, she was having, she's plugged up, right? <laughs> I mean, she was just plugged up and, um, but the, the real bummer about that, I'll just add this on cause just, the Lord's just really blessed her anyway, even in the midst of, I mean, it was her birthday. What a horrible birthday present, right? Yesterday was her birthday and here she is in the, spends it in the, uh, in the emergency room. I mean, so I think I have it bad, you know, <laughs> trying to plan things out. No, here she is in pain this whole time. So uh, anyway, she's doing better. She's really tired today. So she didn't end up coming, but they were able to help. And that, that was really a blessing, but you never know. I mean, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we plan these things out. We think that we have it all together. And then, you know, something like that happens and it just shoots everything. What do we do? We trust the Lord, right? That he's timeless, that he's outside of it, that he has some other he has some other thing in it for us, whatever that may be, whether it's blessing, whether it's the perfection of his will, will coming through, whether it's meeting somebody or ministering or serving, you know, who knows what the Lord is going to do and how he's going to bring that up in, in our lives and how he's going to use that time. So, you know, it's hard for us to understand that timelessness. And I think that when we look at um, 2 Peter here and we go through and we just see the verse 9, there are some qualities and some characteristics and part of the nature of God that Peter brings in to give us, well, how do we relate to that? Because it's really hard for us to relate to timelessness, right? I mean, super hard for us to really know, how, and we can't know that, but we can know things about God's character. We can know things about his nature. We can, when, so we don't get discouraged. We can know who he is and how he works within the world and within our lives and that he has worked in the past. And so this is that first idea there that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. What? He's not slack. So what is he? He's faithful. He's faithful to his promise. And, you know, in context here, that promise that he's being faithful is that he will come back that he is going to come back, that he will do exactly what he has said throughout, um, throughout the Bible. I mean, a, a major portion of the Bible is prophecy, and a lot of it is not fulfilled yet. He's faithful. He's going to fulfill those things. 
We don't understand it. And, you know, sometimes even some doctrines have been come up within the church and we've made, we've, we've, we've made doctrines to try to understand some of these things that are timeless and that are hard for us to understand. So we try to fit within what we can understand a doctrine. But really, God is outside of all that. He can do whatever he wants, right? But he's faithful. He, what he said, he will do. He will do it. He will completely do it. To the fullest. Look at what Numbers says here. Numbers 23 and 19, and it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and he will not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? I mean, the reality is, God has said things, and he will do exactly what he said. Um. Here's another really great verse that brings us to that conclusion too. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He is faithful. He will do exactly what he promised. And that brings us to the point of, well, what has he promised? What are the promises of God? And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we are in his word. You know, that we spend some time there getting to know who he is. We get to know his character. We get to know what he has said. And it's really important that we understand what are his promises. How about this one? You know, that he says, he says to us in Matthew 10, uh, 28, that uh, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, that is a great promise. That's an awesome promise. That he will give us rest if we'll come to him? I mean, that doesn't just, that doesn't just equate to salvation and, and coming to him, you know, and having forgiveness of our sin and entering into relationship with him. No, that follows us throughout all the circumstances and situations that we are. Come to him when we're heavy laden and he will give us rest. I mean, that is an amazing promise. How about, um, you know, in 1 John 1 9, where he says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, that's amazing. That doesn't just refer to, um, you know, a one time deal or to just that salvation time when you were justified and born again. It doesn't just refer to that, it refers to a life of that, confessing, understanding who we are, agreeing with what the Lord has said. I mean, that is so important for us. And he promises that he will forgive us and cleanse us. I mean, that's amazing. That is a beautiful promise that the Lord has. And something daily, you know, that we should remember. The promises of God, he is faithful in all things. So, I mean, I don't know. What are your favorite promises? (laughs) What are the favorite things that you see in the word that God has spoken to you? How has he personally made his word come alive in that area of promises? You can hold on to those things. And obviously the promise that he is coming back for us. I mean, that is, that is amazing. I I think of another promise that's really great is, you know, that he gave to the woman at the well when he was talking to her about living water, the promise of everlasting life. I mean, that's amazing. That's the hope that we have in the Lord. He is faithful and he's going to fulfill every one of the promises, whether they're general things about our Christian life, even the certain particular ones that he gives to you personally. And I just think that that is so awesome. He's a personal God who is faithful in all things. The second characteristic or the second nature of God, piece of the nature of God that we see is long-suffering or that God is patient. And it says here, but, so he's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. He's patient. (laughs) Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, I... You know, I know that these are this, these are simple things that maybe you think about off and on, you know, in your Christian life. But, you know, what Peter is trying to do here and what we do here every Sunday is we're trying to stir up in our minds, you know, that and remember what the Lord has said in his word. He is patient. He is a patient God. And, you know, we could say in contrast to that, 
that we are not very patient, are we? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to tell you that you have to be patient because I think we all get that, right? I mean, I think, I think everybody really understands that, you know, it's better off in relationships actually with other people are a lot better if you're patient with them, right? <laughs> uh, you can get into all kinds of difficulty and all kinds of, uh, you know, arguing and that kind of stuff when we're not patient. And we see that a lot in the world around us today. But that patience is really uh, something that we we can have difficulty with. I was just over in Denver this last week and we were just stuck in traffic. And, you know, you, <laughs> you've probably been there before, you know, where you're driving through traffic and it's all plugged up and you're wondering, well, I wonder if there's an accident. I wonder if there's this. I wonder if that's going on. I wonder how or what's creating all this, you know, and then you get to the end of it and you're like, nothing. <laughs> you know, it just all clears out and all of a sudden you've said all this stuff and you've, you know, you've said these things and all of a sudden you realize there was nothing really there. And it just kind of clears out and everybody's just on their happy, merry way. You know, so, you know, but in that time, I mean, that can really be a real trigger for some people, right? <laughs> the, the patience, you know, just being in there. I don't know what your triggers are for that. I don't know how, you know, what makes you unpatient, impatient. I mean, we all have those kinds of things, but it's amazing. God is super patient. He's always patient. He is very, very patient. And maybe you can think back through your life and you can see how God has been patient with you, how he has. Uh, and, and we need to remember those things, that he has been patient with us, that he has demonstrated his patience to us in many, many ways. You know, in uh, the fruit of the Spirit, right? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It is a working out of the Spirit of God through this moral body, this body that he has given to me. It's a working of God. We experience the Lord in these ways. We experience the Lord in our patience. I mean, when we, we are, we are experiencing and exhibiting a characteristic of God that he plants in us through the power of his spirit. I mean, that's amazing. That's awesome. We need to be reminded of that. Because we think, oh, well, I just need to be patient for this and this and this. But not really. We need to be patient because that's fellowship with God. That is worshiping God. That is going God's way and not our way. In a way, that's almost like being repentant. We're repentant when we turn away from frustration, from when we turn away from aggravation. You know, those kinds of things, we turn into the patience of God and we fellowship with him in it. I mean, that is just, I mean, that's awesome that we have a chance to be able to do that. And you know, you, you know, and you've been there when you've allowed the Lord, when those things to bubble up in your life, how, how, how what a blessing that is in your personal walk. Don't, haven't you experienced that? When you've been patient with somebody and you really realize that God did something that you know is really hard for you to do. I, I've experienced that in the office many times when I've just put down the things that I want to say because I'm impatient with what has been said or I have another opinion or whatever and I press that down and then I allow the Lord to work his character in me. I mean, it is a blessing because then you experience the Lord. You experience something other, which is what Peter is trying to remind us that there is other than our perspective. There is other. It's God. That's the other that he wants us to experience. And so in this, um, you know, God is patient. Here's some verses that really lead us to that place in Exodus 34. You know, this is one of those amazing scriptures where Moses, he really wanted to experience the Lord. He wanted to experience him. He wanted to know him. And I just love Moses' heart there. The Lord promises that he would go to this cleft of the rock and that he was going to pass by and he was going to show him his backside or the backside of his glory, which is amazing. And this is what the Lord says about himself. This isn't just, you know, somebody writing down what he thought about the Lord. No, this is God's word, what he has said about himself. And the Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. That's what he, he said, that he was long-suffering. And it says that he extends that to generations. Not just in one instance, but he extends that to generations. And so uh, I love that because we're part of that. He extends that down through the generations. 
Um, he is patient. So, you know, in our context here, Peter's talking about that the Lord is coming back. Well, he's patient. He's patient. And we'll see that the reason is for mercy. And we'll see that here in a second. But here's another one that talks about his, pa- or his patience. And consider that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. I love that. You know, this is what his patience leads to. It leads to salvation. And we're just not, I don't think that, you know, salvation is a bigger idea than what we generally think. You know, I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord. I don't know if you have, you know, asked the Lord into your heart if you're born again today. I pray that you are. I mean, you have a chance here this morning to do that if you would want to. But we're all on some kind of a journey in that process of knowing the Lord. And so salvation is a bigger idea than, um, you know, than just believing in the Lord. That's initially we're justified by faith as we trust in Jesus and the sacrifice that he has given for us, hanging there on the tree, shedding his blood, you know, being the sacrifice for sin. That, and then we believe, we trust in that, we trust in what he's done, and we're justified before God. We can stand before him. We can actually have eternal life and stand in his presence in fellowship with him. But the rest of salvation, there's more. There's, there's, there's two more parts to salvation. And the second part of that is that sanctification process that we go through, right? We're, we're saved. We've come into a relationship with God. We have fellowship with him. And now there's this part that we're in where we are sanctified or being set apart for him. Being set apart for his purposes and for his working in this world and in the circumstances and the things around us. And we find ourselves in that. And I think, you know, in some ways, when we look at um, um, Second Peter there, I mean, that is really what, what he's talking about. We need to remember the Lord in that because we are being sanctified. We are in the process of being sanctified and set apart for the Lord. Why? What is the deal there? Well, I think it's really simple. The Lord sets us apart because he wants us to be a sign to the world around us. He wants us to express these very things that we're talking about. Well, we can't really express express timelessness, but we can express the character of God through the indwelling presence of his spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are the things that, um, you know, you can't find in the world. Those are things that God brings into the heart and the life of his people. And then we shed it abroad in the world and the circumstances, situations that we're in. I mean, not just, you know, there's, there's non-believers for sure, but it also works within this church that we have. It works within your family that you would shed abroad in your marriage, right? Patience, long-suffering, merciful, graciousness, love. You know, it's the outflowing and the outworking of God in every single one of the circumstances, the relationships, the situations that we're in. It is that sanctification process, being set apart for the Lord, being set apart for his purposes, being effective and fruitful in what he's called us to. And so, you know, that's, that's the second part is that sanctification part. But then the third part is super exciting, which Peter is talking about here, when we're going to meet him face to face, right? Glorification. We're going to be out of this body that's bound by time, bound by, um, you know, the structure of this life, the, the, the material, things of this life, and we're going to be in his presence for eternity. I mean, that is amazing, right? That's the final part. That's what everything's leading up to. That's the purpose of Christ's death and his resurrection. That's what he desires. That's what he wants is for us to enter in to fellowship with him. And so I love this verse in 2 Peter 3.15 because it really shows that his long suffering and his patience, it has a goal. And that goal is salvation which is fellowship with the Lord. He wants that. He wants relationship with us. And that is an amazing thing and a blessing that we can enter in to fellowship with him. I am so thankful that that is his heart. And we see that even more in this next part that says, um, but that all should come to repentance. You know, he's not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. That is God's heart and that is God's will. And I, I just point out to you that there are a couple of uh, words there that are pretty key. They're tiny words, but they're really important. It says, it says there that he's not willing that any should perish. Not any. That's God's heart. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And he says here that all, so, so he doesn't want any, any to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. Those are two little words, but they make a whole lot of difference. God's heart is not, his will is not for mankind to, you know, to perish. That is not what he wants. He is a merciful God. We read that earlier there in Exodus 34, but look at what this says too. Ezekiel, I've been reading through in my daily readings through the Old Testament, and I've been in Ezekiel lately, and in, in chapter 18, verse 23, it says, this is the Lord speaking, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God? and not that he should turn from his way, ways and live? I mean, that's God's heart. God's heart is that we would turn from our way. That's what repentance is. That's what we see right here in, um, in 2 Peter, that we should come, that all should come to repentance. And that simply is what repentance is, turning from his way. That's God's heart. So we, we say, right, we say that we want to see the Lord come back. We're looking forward to that. We don't want to be discouraged. And there's a reason for that, right? I mean, have you ever thought, and, and I know I've talked to several people, have we gone through Revelation, or maybe you, uh, you know, maybe you're just talking to the people that you naturally have fellowship and you say something like, man, I can't wait for the Lord to come back, right? Have you ever said that? Oh, I can't wait. We see, and there's all kinds of reasons for that, right? I mean, the first reason probably is uh, we want fellowship with the Lord. We want to see him return because we want to be in his presence, Right? I mean, that's one of the reasons. I think that's a great reason. It's our hope, you know? Um, maybe we want to get out of, there's other reasons too. Maybe we want to get out of the circumstances or the situations that we have. Maybe we want that new body, you know, that we're tired of this old one, you know, clunking around and blowing around in the wind, you know? And, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of reasons that we can have for that. But there's always, when we talk about that, isn't there in your heart, isn't there like, but right? You say, I want the Lord to come back, but, but, you know, the same thing with the Lord. He wants to come back. He wants to fellowship with us and bring us into his presence, but there's a lot of people that don't know him, right? I mean, isn't that the next thought that enters into your mind when you say, I can't wait for the Lord to come back? But what about my family? What about my friends? What about these people over here? What about what's going, you know, what's going to happen to them? You know, that, I mean, that often happens to us. And I, that is great because that is the heart of the Lord. That's exactly his heart. That's what Peter is saying here. He's saying, yes, God is faithful. He's going to come back. God is patient, but he's also, God is mercy. He is mercy. He wants all to come to repentance. He wants everyone to come to repentance. And that is his heart. And so there are so many uh, scriptures that really talk about that through, uh, through the word of God. I mean, this is one from Ezekiel. Here's another one um, in John 1, 12 and 13. It says, but as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or the or the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. It shows us, this passage shows us, it's the will of God. He wants this, this progression, this, he wants salvation to happen in all people. He wants us to come to know him. Um, here's another one, Romans 10, 12, and it says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich, to all who call upon him. And verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever, you know, that's his heart. He wants all to come to him and he is merciful. That mercy is a super, you know, it, it's, it's an easy concept. I used to try to teach that to my kids as I would say, well, you really deserve this, but this time we're not gonna do that because I'm gonna have mercy 
on you. <laughs> you know, you deserve this, but I'm going to give you something else. That's the definition of mercy, that we receive something that we really don't deserve. And, we, and the awesome thing is, we, <laughs> we don't receive something that we do deserve. And that's what this verse brings up, that he doesn't want anyone to perish. That's what we deserve, apart from him. Because those are the decisions in our human nature, in our human flesh. That's the natural tendency is to reject and push away. It's in nature. And that is what has to be pushed out. That has to go away. And by faith, we enter into what Jesus has done, and we push that out, and we receive Jesus and what he has into our heart, into our life, that we can have fellowship with him. One of the awesome things that um, I, I just love about this particular verse that we're ending with is this idea here, and it kind of kind of hit me in um, in a surprising way because I was thinking that 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 word there come at the end of verse nine it says that he doesn't he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. I was thinking that that was just the the word. Um, you know, that is uh, like the word that I said before, come unto me, all you who are uh, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That, that kind of come is, come, you know, come here. <laughs> come over here, come hither, you know, come to where I'm at. You know, it's this invitation to come. You know, and there are other, a lot of different places where that is what God is saying to us. But this is a different come. This is a whole different idea. And I just think that this is awesome. This is God's heart that all should come to repentance. And what that word there means, come, it means to be in space or to give space to, to admit. So it's like, it's like opening up and, and giving space to something, to repentance. And that's what God is calling us. I, it's a beautiful idea there. Because we as people, what, what we do is we just stuff our life full of all kinds of stuff, don't we? There needs to be room in our life. And so this is the question that we're going to end with is, is there room? Is there room? Is there room for the Lord to work through all of the things that he wants, wants to work through? Um, you know, and I think that this applies to all of us. You know, in, in the context here, we're looking, at, we're looking at that he wants them to come to repentance, to salvation, to fellowship with him. But one, that's not really a one-time, that's not just a one-time thing that happens in our lives. I mean, there is that initial justification process. But you know what? I've found in my own life that I live, I need to live in repentance. I need to live in that idea of repentance. You know what? Here's a, here's a way that we could actually look at that. Jesus was living in that. When he came here and showed us how to live for the Father, he didn't do anything that was his will. He did and said all things that were the Lord's will. They were all his Father's will. He walked in his Father's will at all times. That is the idea of repentance, being aligned with God with the Father, being aligned, walking, living out my life in, you know, in, in parallel to the Lord. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He lived that life of being under God's submission to the Lord in all things that he said and all things that he did. And that is so important for us to remember. And that's this idea here that we, we can, no matter where we are at, in our relationship with the Lord, there should be that walk of repentance in our lives because that's the desire that the Lord has that we would walk in that way, in repentance. And that means that we make room for God to do what he wants to do in us and what he can do in our lives and in the situations that we find ourselves in. I don't know. You know, I don't know how the first time that you ever received the Lord into your life, I don't know if you've done that this morning, or I don't know if you can think back to that. What was it like? For all of us, it's kind of different. But there is, in all of it, the idea of making room, making space, kicking out all these other things and allowing him to have room in our heart and in our life. 
you know, for me, I was a young, young kid, you know, when I accepted the Lord and, and started to walk with him. But I remember there were times where that started, where that, where that, that, that real place of making room for the Lord started in my life, where I, you know, where I realized what his desire was in my life. Um, one of those was I was, um, one of the things that was really instrumental, I think, in my life was actually Keith Green. I really liked music. And um, so Keith Green was really uh, a guy that I listened to. My mom and dad listened to it. They got all of his records whenever they came out. You know, we'd, we'd sit there in the living room and we'd listen to the record, right, because it was on records. And, uh, um, and uh, I remember being about 10 years old, sitting in front of the speaker there, listening to Make My Heart a Prayer for You. Um, on No Compromise, that album, and just really being impacted by that song. Make my life a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. Um, You know, that was a time where as a young child, I was actually, I I really believe, I really wanted that, but I was making room for it. You know, I was making room for what God was doing and working in my life. It's super important for us when we sense and when we know that the Lord is doing something and when he is moving in our life to respond and to react to that because that is the following up, making room, letting him work, letting him do what he wants to do in us and through us. And he wants to do so much in, in the power of his Holy Spirit as he's given that to us. So I don't know what your, I don't know what your experience was. I don't know how that works out in your life. You know, there are certain times throughout my day you know, I, I don't know. I mean, yesterday, I, you know, in that whole circumstance, I could have really gotten really frustrated and angry and in, in my heart. And yet there is that making room for the Lord, right? To say, okay, this is part of your plan. I don't know what's going on here. I surrender. I align with you. It's a repentant kind of heart. It's a humbling of who we are and allowing the Lord to work. I don't have to control every circumstance. I see God's timeless hand in all of it. I didn't say this in first service, but you know one of the one of my favorite stories um, in the Bible, and one of my favorite characters is um, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, he's really favorite. You're going, yeah, right. He's your favorite character. Yeah. How come I can't think? Joseph? Oh goodness. Yeah, Joseph. And you know what? One of the interesting things about Joseph's, the, the writing there of Joseph, we don't have a whole lot of talk about doctrine or, um, you know, we don't see God or him praying or, you know, we don't see a whole lot of that. There's not a whole lot of spiritual religious stuff in it. But God is working through every one of those circumstances, timeless in his idea and bringing Joseph through to this final thing that saves the nation of Israel and It saves the Egyptians and the nation of Israel on top of it. I mean, it's just an amazing progression of God's faithfulness, his patience, his mercy, his sanctification of Joseph being in prison and all of that. I mean, it's a great example for us to see that what God said to Abraham, he was going to fulfill. And he did it through a guy like Joseph, who was just there in the moment. Those are the things that God wants to do in our lives, in our families, in our marriages, with our children, with our co-workers, that we would see God's timeless purpose and, and just see that he is timeless and that he has purpose in the midst of all that, that he is, he is, he is faithful, he's patient, and he's merciful. And so I just want to leave you with that question, is there room? Is there room tomorrow for the Lord to work? Is there room in your marriage? You know, is there room with your children for you to be gracious, loving, merciful to them, to give wisdom, God's wisdom, not just your own opinion, (laughs) you know, because, right? I mean, with kids, it's really easy just to download or with people that you're close to just to just download your opinion to them, what you think. No, is there room for God to break through, you know, those things that we naturally think and allow him to do something supernatural in your marriage? You know, I've, I've thought about this, you know, because I've had some friends go through some difficult things in their marriages, some divorces, things like that. And, you know, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the relationships that is so easy to, I don't know, just really um, take for granted. 
I guess. You know, to take for granted the love that God has put there and what happened a long time ago. And it's really easy for us to just forget and to get caught up in circumstances, things that are happening. Well, she's this way or he's this way all the time. He always does that, you know. There's a place that I've found, it seems like, in marriages when I've done marriage counseling or things like that, where people just stop making room for the grace of God. They just stop. I mean, you think about your spouse. Think about your spouse, okay? Think about them. Have they changed a whole lot? I mean, yeah, I mean, they look different, you know, they're wearing different clothes maybe and all that kind of stuff. There's things on the surface that change, but have they changed all that much? Has their personality changed? Has all this? You know, in all of these things, when there are things like that, I go back, you know, there's this term that says, well, I just, I'm, I, I'm just not in love with you. I've fallen out of love with you. What's really changed? Is it that person? Probably not. In most cases, not. All of those things were working in their personality and in their life. If you've been married to somebody for a long time, you realize that, that they're the same kind of person. That you, you almost know what they're going to say or what, how they're going to react to a situation. You could say it. You can maybe even say the exact words that they're going to say. See, that's how we are. We don't really change all that much. But what happens and what I think the mechanism is there when we say that we're out of love with this person or we've fallen out of love, it's because we have chosen... Because love actually is by will. We enter into a love relationship with somebody willfully into that. So when we say, I don't have love, we've chosen and we've make it, made this decision that we're not going to extend mercy. We're not going to extend patience. We're not going to be gracious anymore. We're at our end. We're done. See, that's not making room for the Lord to work and to heal because that's exactly what God wants to do in our marriage. I mean, come on. God is for marriage. God is for marriage. God is for that relationship in like he is, like he's for nothing else. I mean, it, it, is, it is important in his heart and in his mind. So much so that he gives us Ephesians and he gives us that great equation of how Jesus loves his church and how I as a husband am to love my wife. You know, that's, 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 that's amazing. We need to make room for the Lord to do what he wants to do and what he can do in the situations of our life. We need to not constrict it down to what we think or our opinion. We need to allow the Lord to have room. And I, I guarantee you that you'll, you'll see results. You'll see fruitfulness in that. When your heart changes, when you come to a place where I'm going to extend the grace that I've always extended to my wife, I'm going to extend that patience and that mercy to her no matter what. <laughs> That's that willful choice that we make to allow the Lord to do it in us. You know, and I, I don't know. You know, I've been married for, I don't know, we're going on 30 years. Something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't actually going to say all this. But anyway, um, uh, you know, I've been married, and through those years, there have been times where I've been impatient with something, or something wasn't quite right, and you can just feel that your love is slipping, or that things aren't quite the way that they were before. And in my own life, in my own heart, what I've found is when I go back and do some of the things, <laughs> like what it says there in Revelation, what Jesus says to the churches there, to go back to repent and to repeat and redo the first things. So in times like that, what I've done is I've made myself do the hard thing, which is go to my wife in the morning. She's laying there sleeping and I'm get up early in the morning. And I, and I really did. I, I really made this conscious decision. I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to kiss her and I'm going to say, I love you. And I'm look forward to seeing you. I do that every morning now because I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want my heart to change. See, she's who she is, and she is who she's always been. And you know what? I can't control that anyway. I can't make her do anything. But man, I can change the way that I walk. I can change the things that I say. 
And so I, I would, I mean, if you're struggling in any relationship that you have, do the hard thing. Do the hard thing. Go to them. Love them. Be gracious to them. Do the things that you used to do. Give them a kiss. Give them a hug. Be understanding and listening. Do something spontaneous. You know, I don't know. Do the things that you used to do. And don't allow, you know, just that, I don't know, discouragement, whatever, the troubles, the heaviness of life. Don't allow that to push you away from those things that God really wants to do, rising up in you, giving you his grace, his mercy, his patience. 